if I have to give a speech where I'm not prepared, I am utterly, utterly terrified. Even though I have enough technique to be able to go out there and probably wing it better than the average speaker. But I'm still petrified because I know it will be subpar. But if I've prepared in such a way that I know exactly what I'm going to do before I do it, then my anxiety goes down. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to a brand new episode of the None of Your Business podcast. Sean Dill here, and boy, are you in for a real treat today. I'm in for a real treat as well because I have not been able to catch up with this individual in quite some time. And so selfishly, I'm super excited that I'm going to get this time um, alone with him to hang out and chat and get caught up and you guys get to eavesdrop in on this phenomenal person and uh, as we find out what he's up to, what he's been doing. But let me just start, sometimes I just cut right into the interview, but I do want to begin by saying, this person is actually responsible for giving me my start into the consulting world. Um, You know, I worked as a practicing chiropractor for many, many years in Costa Rica, moved back to the United States, opened up a practice here in the United States, then started to think about how I could make a bigger impact beyond just the people that I was seeing in my own office. And I remember one day uh, I had read this book, Book Yourself Solid, New York Times bestselling book. I recommend that everybody check it out. We'll put the link to the book in the in the show notes here. Um, that's the starting point. If anybody asks me ever, where do I start? I want to be an entrepreneur with a service-based business. You start with Book Yourself Solid. So I read this book and I was like, this is amazing. I was teaching at Life Chiropractic College West and I decided to use this book um, as the recommended textbook for one of the courses that I was teaching on communication. And then one day it occurred to me, I went to my wife, my girlfriend at the time, Lacey, and I was like, you know, I want to work with this guy, Michael Port. That's our guest today. And honestly, and I think that Michael can verify this and share that you probably knew this to be true. At that time, I didn't have the money to be able to work with him. Um, One of the angles that I found in order to get closer to him was there was a group that I was working with that was putting on a conference. And I wanted them to hire Michael to give a presentation. And that's going to be important today as well. And he came out, did a presentation in San Jose for us, and it was spectacular. Um, And then I began shortly after that working with him again with money that I just honestly didn't have. But I began his Book Yourself Solid Coaches Training Program. Um, Really, not because I wanted to coach, but because I wanted to learn the information more in depth. Um, and then I got my, I became a book yourself solid certified coach and something amazing happened during that process. And I don't know if Michael remembers this either, uh, but we were, I think that we were piloted on the heroic public speaking, um, sort of pilot program. And he knew that I had some interest in speaking and asked me, um, to come up to the front and, and he worked with me, um, extensively. Uh, to help me with my speaking. I remember there was sort of a signature story, and to this day, I still tell it in many of my presentations about Rosa Parks. And he worked with me, I mean, for a long time on two words. I had to say, not today. And I had to say it so many times until I got it right. And to this day, people still ask me when they hear me speak, hey, how did you learn how to do your talks? And again, you have to go to heroic public speaking with Michael and Amy Port. So today we are so blessed because we have right here with us the one and only Michael Port. Thanks, Michael, for joining us. It's so awesome to have you. It's really a pleasure to be here. I love love these strolls down memory lane, and I'm just so thrilled to see uh, what an extraordinary community you've developed over these years. I'm so proud of you. 
Well, thank you. That means that means a whole lot coming from a mentor like yourself. Um, I want to catch everybody up that may not know. Um, just a sort of a brief overview, hit a couple key points because I want to link these two things together. You started out your career, um, not technically, but you have this this period of time when you start out in acting. And you were famously in this Budweiser commercial. The uh, you played a role where you were the the gentleman in the in the phone booth. Um, tell us about that time when you were pursuing acting um, and what that looked like. Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I fell in love with acting when I was in college, and uh, I had been studying psychology at the time. Uh, but my father came and saw me in a play, and he happens to be a psychiatrist. And he said to me, you know, Michael, given your personality, I think you'll learn more about people if you study theater and acting uh, rather than the academics of psychology. And that's not typical for a parent to say. Uh, so I took his advice and I applied uh, to grad school for acting and I got a master's uh, from NYU in acting. And uh, those were incredibly informative years. And then I went out and worked for four years as a professional actor. And I did shows like Sex in the City, Third Watch, Law and Order, All My Children, Another World, uh, 100 Center Street uh, was a show that uh, didn't really go anywhere. But uh, I had a great time with it. I did you know small roles in films like The Pelican Brief, Down to Earth, uh, The Believer. But I did do a lot of commercials and a lot of voiceovers. So I did the voice for... AT&T, uh, uh, um, HGTV, uh, Pizza Hut, Braun, AT&T. You might remember, call 1-800-ATT. <laughs> so uh, that also um, was interesting, but ultimately I didn't love the lifestyle uh, of an actor. I wanted to, 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 to produce results faster. I wanted to have more control. Uh, I wanted to be a producer but not in film or TV. And so I thought, well, maybe if I go into the fitness industry, uh, maybe that'll be the ticket for me. And I spent about five years there. Uh, and I know I had a lot of great experiences, uh, but ultimately I realized that I was an entrepreneur and I needed to do something on my own. So I took the experience that I had as a performer, uh, but then at the time, uh, most of the experience that I had on the business side of the fitness industry and I went into consultant, consulting for the fitness industry. And then 20 years later, uh, the journey just continues uh, to surprise me and amaze me uh, by what's possible. And uh, yeah, my first big set of intellectual property was Book Yourself Solid. And I spent the first uh, 15 years of my uh, focus on entrepreneurship on that set of IP. I wrote a number of other books during that time as well. But most of my focus was on Book Yourself Solid. And then, as you said, I started piloting, uh, working with people on their public speaking and communication because, of course, that was my specialty. That was my bread and butter. And I do remember that uh, time working with you specifically. I, I can visualize the space that we were in uh, at the hotel, uh, in the ballroom. And what I would do every once in a while, if I had an hour of programming available at one of the Book Yourself Solid workshops or, or uh, events, was I put somebody up on stage and work with them and they're speaking. And I remember when I was working with you, I remember looking out into the audience at one point and I remember seeing people's mouths open, you know, just shocked at the transformation that was so quickly occurring on stage. And I remember saying to somebody, what, you guys look really surprised. And, uh, and someone said, well, no, it's not, we're not surprised that Sean is making this transformation, but we've never seen a transformation happen so quickly, uh, you know, with a performer, with a speaker like this. And I said, but isn't this how everybody teaches public speaking in, in the industry? I mean, you guys go to more events than I do. Haven't, have you seen, you know, have you taken courses on public speaking? And I remember someone saying, Michael, are you an idiot? which is not usually how people speak to me. And I, I said, well, I may be, but you're going to have to be a little bit more specific. And they said, this is not even remotely close to the way that most of this is taught. Usually they just tell you, you know, do this with your hands or don't do this with your hands or look them in the eye or, you know, some of these very basic 
uh, I suppose, sophomoric uh, uh, techniques. But what we were doing was what a director does when they work with actors, because that's what I understood. That's what I was trained in. That's what I knew how to do. And, and speaking and acting are not the same thing. Let's be clear about that. But the techniques that an actor uses to create a transformational experience are techniques that a speaker can use as well. So that's what I was teaching you. I was working with you as a director. Uh, and it was at that point, actually, Sean, that I realized, oh, there's an opportunity for me to take all of that craft that I developed over the years and really bring it to this underserved uh, population of speakers who do not actually have craft when it comes to performing. Usually they just do whatever they see somebody else do, which is put up a bunch of slides, you know, use the slides as their notes, and then wing it in between that and just hopefully end uh, on time and actually get in all their content. And generally, they underperform their capabilities. Uh, they, they, they think they're going to rise to the occasion, but you know, we know from the military that you do not rise to the occasion. You fall back on your preparation, on your training. And if you're not prepared to deliver a speech in a high stakes environment, you know, where you uh, have great hopes of, of affecting the way the audience feels, thinks and acts, you're not going to do it any better than you rehearsed it prior to actually delivering it. And so, uh, so that was a huge revelation for me. And that's when I started moving my focus uh, into heroic public speaking. And uh, now, of course, as you know, uh, Matthew Kimberly runs the Book Yourself Solid organization, uh, and, uh, and I'm uh, running the Heroic Public Speaking organization. Let's uh, get everybody caught up just on sorting this out. Uh, book Yourself Solid, you can still check that out. You can get a copy of the book. You can visit bookyourselfsolid.com. As uh, Michael said, Matthew Kimberly um, leading that up, and Matthew also um, very much responsible for a lot of my success as well, and I've had the pleasure of working with him on several projects in the past. Highly recommend that that is your starting point. Then from there, um, heroicpublicspeaking.com. That's where you can get information about what we're going to be talking about today. One of the things that absolutely impressed me, so I did that sort of you know one-hour snippet with you, then you uh, created a creative live. And I, at the time, was living in San Francisco. So I messaged you and I said, Michael, can I come to creative live to watch the program? But I already know what you're going to do. You're going to pick people to go up on stage. And can you please pick Lacey? And you so graciously agreed. Um, to this day, if you purchased a creative live um, nice gateway to kind of get an overview of what you might learn with Michael and Amy. Um, you can see them working there one-on-one -on -one with Lacey. I'm in the video as well. Omar, a lot of really great people um, in that particular cast as well. Um, one of the things that super impressed me, Michael, was the level of preparation that goes into even the content side. Can you talk to me a little bit about content preparation and then the table read the table read for me was something that just, that concept was amazing and helped me so much. Sure. So giving speeches um, is a creative art. The, the thing about creative art that is sometimes elusive is that it, it often seems like you can do it if you have talent and there's some sort of magic associated with people who can... Uh, who can perform because they're talented at it. Um, but the fact of the matter is really great creative artists all have processes that they use to develop their work. Now they may have talent, but talent is really overrated. I mean, we all know people who had an enormous amount of talent that squandered it, that did nothing with it. And we all know people who didn't seem like they had that much talent, but they worked and worked and worked to develop proficiency in their chosen field and as a result became incredibly successful. So... You know, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things that I, I wish people knew going into it, but 
I know that they see it when they start doing this work with us. They realize, oh, wow, I've either been relying on my talent and, uh, and doing an okay job, but have not gotten even close to what I'm capable of if I started developing uh, proficiency of craft. And then on the other hand, people who think that they're not talented so that they don't have a lot of options realize, oh my gosh, wait, A, I have more talent than I realized because all of us as human beings are creative artists. Some of us may have uh, spent more time exploring our, our ability to be creative and others uh, may not. So we may need to rekindle uh, our creativity, but the recognize that that you probably have more talent than you think, but you actually need less talent than you might think to be incredibly effective. So what we do is we designed processes, some of which are processes that come out of hundreds and hundreds of years of professional performing that we have re-engineered for the professional speaker or even the speaker who just needs to give a speech every once in a while but wants to be incredibly effective so that you can use the processes to get into the development of the speech itself, and then the rehearsal of the speech so you can then deliver it uh, to great effect. And so it, it's a little bit like, you know, I, I suppose I remember the first time I ever went to a, a chiropractor and they gave me an adjustment on my neck. And I, I, and I, I was, first of all, in that moment of like, what just happened? You know, like completely, like a little, all the endorphins are running around my brain. And I'm like, okay, that was this craziest thing that just ever happened. And I said, how did you do that? I was like, that was like magic. And I remember he, he kind of looked at me and furred his brows and he's like, no, that was just technique. And it's, it's, it's uh, anybody that's developed proficiency in a particular discipline knows the importance of technique, knows the importance of process. When you're evaluating a patient, you have a process that you go through to evaluate that patient. You don't just, you know, willy nilly start adjusting them randomly, uh, you know, because you feel like the spirit moved you. You go through a process where you analyze the work that needs to be done. And so the same thing is true for us. What we do is we look at the objective that the speaker has for their speech. Of course, you need to consider the medium. You know, are you doing a 20-minute TED-style talk? Are you doing a 45-minute uh, breakout session? Are you doing a 60-minute keynote session? Uh, you know, there are a lot of different types of presentations that people give, and there are different requirements for those uh, types of presentations. You know, for example, if you're doing... Uh, there's a difference between a workshop, a breakout, and a keynote. A workshop and a breakout and a keynote are very different, but people approach them as if they're the same thing. A keynote uh, is, is an opportunity for someone to strike a keynote, to get the audience feeling and thinking about something in a different way. And... Uh, and so when we're delivering keynotes, we're usually delivering how to think speeches, how to think differently about the world, to try to change the way people think. Of course, in order to change the way people think, you need to change the way they feel. But breakout sessions are generally how-to type sessions. We're usually delivering uh, um, tips and tricks and protocols for how to do something. It doesn't mean that there isn't a strong message that supports that presentation, but that's generally what meeting planners expect from breakout sessions. And then workshops, of course, are different because in the workshop, you're actually helping the people in the workshop uh, do the work. You facilitate uh, their experience of doing the work, getting it done in that particular session. So, you know, each one requires a different approach. But once you know which one you're doing and where, what are, and the approach that you're taking, um, you got to be really, really clear on your super objective. And um, and we've developed a process that we call the foundational five. There are five foundational elements that exist in in every speech, regardless of whether. Uh, you're doing a workshop, a breakout, or a keynote. And, um, and once you've put those, once you've worked on those five foundational elements, you can then go into the ideation process. It's, it's a mistake generally to sit down and just start writing a script. Uh, just like you wouldn't just start writing a book, you would go through an ideation process to structure it, uh, identify 
a whole host of elements first before you start writing a script. So first we do the foundational five, then we go into a cataloging content process where we identify all the different content that we already have um, and put it into the right category so that we can deploy that content at the right part of the speech. Once you've done the foundational five and the, um, and the cataloging of content, uh, then you'll often move into choosing a particular framework for the speech. So you can use that framework as a structure, as an outline for the speech. And then you start to go into the actual writing process. And the writing process is something that people often do because often skip because they think they're subject matter experts. So they say, well, I know my material so well, I don't really need to write a script because, you know, I can just have an outline and then I can just wing it inside of it and I can just talk to or address those different uh, points. And you absolutely can and it can work. Uh, but, but when we're looking at the quality of speech that we want to deliver, we should ask ourselves what the stakes are for that particular speech and how often are you going to give that speech? Meaning, you know, if, if one of my, if my, if my sixth graders teacher called me up and said, listen, can you come in and talk about entrepreneurship or can you talk about speaking or, or, you know, any of the subjects that I know a little bit about, uh, I, I'm not going to be too worried about that speech, meaning it's not a high stakes speech for me. I'm not getting paid. And they're sixth, sixth graders. Now, th th that might present, you know, its own set of anxieties. But from the actual speech perspective, I'm not too worried about the stakes. But um, if I get called to give a speech in front of 5,000 people at Lincoln Center, mm, the stakes are a little bit higher. And if uh, I'm getting paid, you know, $40,000 to give that speech, the stakes are much higher. The expectations are much higher. So I'm going to work more. I'm going to prepare more for a stakes speech that has higher stakes. And so one of the mistakes that people make is they, they spend their time customizing speeches per audience, which on face value seems like a great idea. Like wouldn't all audiences want really highly customized speeches? Um, but a, if you're speaking to so many different audiences, different types of audiences, then the message that you have may actually not work for all those different audiences. So, uh, so th 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 that presents its own issue. It's sort of like having a business with no target market, with no particular group of people that you have uh, focused on serving. But secondly, a customized speech is inherently an underdeveloped speech. Because if you're customizing a speech a week or two before you actually give that speech, the speech is not going to be a well-rehearsed speech. So, for example, when you go to see Hamilton on Broadway, you're not going there thinking, like, geez, I hope they customize this, this, this play for me tonight. That would be really cool if they, they customized it, uh, you know, based on, gosh, I don't know, like where everybody in the audience was from. The politics of the day. Yeah, the politics of the day. Exactly. That's a perfect example. That's even better. So based on the politics of the day. Now, maybe someone could make an argument that you could do an improv uh, type show like that. But there's a big difference between improvisation and, uh, and Broadway. Uh, and this is the perfect example. So when you go watch improv theater, if you do, and most people don't, and there's a reason most people don't, because it just only works once in a while. It doesn't always work. It's a, crap shoot. It's a total, total crap shoot. <laughs> so look, you know, if it, Sean, if you're like, hey, listen, you want to go see some improv? I'd say, yeah, that's great. What does it cost? You'd be like, I think tickets are like 15 bucks or 20 bucks. And uh, yeah, I think there's a two drink minimum or something like at a comedy club. And I'd say, oh, that's fine. Let's do it. I mean, maybe a couple of the skits will work. A couple of them won't. But either way, we'll have a great time. And, you know, it's pretty cheap. So why not? But if you said, um, Michael, uh, you want to go see Hamilton? I said, well, how much are the tickets? You're like, well, they're $3,000 a ticket. I'd say, oh, that shit better work. <laughs> and guess what? It works every single time. Why? Because it's scripted and it's rehearsed. Lin-Manuel de developed that project over a 10-year period of time. 
It took him an entire year just to write the song, My Shot. That one song, a whole year. And so when they deliver that, it works every single time. That's why people will pay thousands of dollars to see it because it's going to work. doesn't matter if they do it on a Tuesday or, or Friday or a Sunday matinee. It works every single time because of the amount of preparation that went into it. So that's the big difference between improv and, 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 and Broadway. And it's the same difference that you get between winging a speech and actually preparing to deliver that speech and knowing it so well that you don't have to think about it. So once you go through this ideation process with the content and then you actually script it, you can then rehearse that script such that you can deliver it anywhere, anytime, on any side stage, in any environment, and you always know it will work. And you're not relying on whether the audience is giving you enough energy or, you know, uh, or, or the expressions that they have on their face. You know it works because you've dialed it in and you know how to deliver it. And so you mentioned something called the table read. Table read is just one step of the seven step rehearsal protocol. Now the seven step rehearsal protocol is something that we've developed uh, based on hundreds of years of rehearsal protocol that professional performers use. And we adapted it to the speaker because again, actors and speakers are not exactly the same, but there's no reason that anyone would know what that protocol is unless they were professional performers. I mean, you know, when I went to NYU grad, there was only 18 people in my class and there was three years. When my wife, Amy, went to the Yale School of Drama to get her master's, I think there were 15 people in her class and there were only three years. So there's only small handfuls of people that, you know, that learn these kinds of protocols and develop this kind of craft. You, you don't get taught in high school. You don't even get taught how to balance a checkbook in high school, for that matter, let alone a rehearsal protocol. So I don't expect anyone to know these things. But sometimes people push back against rehearsal because they say, no, 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 Michael. And I, I've heard this more than once. They say, Michael, I've, I, I understand the, the importance of preparation. I, I mean, I get that, but I've tried rehearsal and it doesn't work. You know, it made me feel stiff and uh, I was, I'm really good on my feet and quick, but I felt ev like everything was slow because I had rehearsed it. And when I was, you know, trying to perform, I just was kind of off, you know, I was like a kind of robotic. And, uh, and I think that the, when I hear people say that, they're, I know they're 100% right. Their experience is exactly that. The rehearsal they did negatively in, influenced their performance. But their attribution, meaning attributing the issue to rehearsal, is not the problem. The problem wasn't that they, were, they did rehearsal. The problem was that they did too little rehearsal. Because if you do only a little bit of rehearsal, what happens when you're trying to perform is you're, you're in front of the audience, whether it's on uh, you know, Zoom uh, or some other video uh, technology, or if you're in front of an audience of people. If you only did a little bit of rehearsal and you don't actually know your material by heart, then what happens is you're trying to recall what you did in rehearsal. And as a result, you're not in the moment when you're actually attempting to perform. And so because you're not in the moment, everything feels off. If you're trying to remember what you did in rehearsal, it will not come out in a way that feels organic or natural uh, or spontaneous to the audience. So what creates spontaneity is the is is having enough preparation that you can also use improvisation so you don't get stuck in what you've rehearsed in such a rigid way that you can't move out of it when the situation calls for it so you're able to use improvisation but you can always jump right back on the tracks and keep going and pick up exactly where you left off and make any adjustments that are necessary because preparation when it meets improvisation that's when you create spontaneity so that it feels like to the audience that it's happening for the very first time, even though you may have rehearsed it dozens or hundreds of times. And so that's what the audience is looking for. They're not 
you know, the audience will say, oh, I want a speech that's totally customized to me that feel that's that the speaker is doing for the very first time, but they don't actually mean that <laughs> they want it to feel that way. But when they see somebody that has got a, a speech that is so dialed in that it works so brilliantly that every story lands uh, perfectly, every, every joke that you tell works uh, that your staging is clean and clear and there's no pacing back and forth on the stage the, and yet it still feels like it's happening for the very first time because the speaker knows it by heart rather than through memorization. They're not just, you know, uh, through rote memorization, just reciting or regurgitating some words, but that there's a driving force behind it. The speaker knows what, how they're trying to make everybody in the audience feel at every moment, how they're trying to what they want them to think at every moment and what they want them to do at every moment, then the audience has what we call a transformational experience as a result. And the, and, and the audience will know, holy cow, they must have worked on that speech for years. That thing is so incredibly good. Thank you. I'm so happy they did that because it felt like it's the very first time that speech was ever given. It felt like it was for me. It felt like they were talking to me. You ever had that experience, Sean, when you're in the audience and you hear in, in the speaker saying something, you go, oh my God, they're talking to me. Yeah. Like nobody time. else. They're just talking to me. That's the feeling that you want your audience to have. But it doesn't generally happen just through accident, you know, through, through the winging of a speech. But again, as I said, if the speech doesn't have high stakes, if it doesn't really matter, don't waste your time and put in a lot of work. But if you do want to use speaking as a way to advance your business, promote your brand or uh, an important mission or a cause or get paid really well to speak, I mean, think about that for a second, getting paid to speak. If you want to get paid to speak, which everybody can do, meaning everybody can just speak. But if you want to get paid to do it, what you're delivering should be pretty darn good. Uh, and, you know, for those people who've written a book, if you've written a substantial book, you know it takes a long time to write that book. It doesn't happen in a weekend. Maybe an article in a weekend, but if I write an article, it usually takes me more than a weekend to write. It might take me a week or two weeks to go through a number of different drafts. A book, you know, I, um, I've got a new book coming out this uh, spring slash summer, and uh, it'll have been two years uh, since my writing partner and I started working on that book. Two years. So, you know, if you're going to give a speech that you want to change the world in some way or the lives of the people in the room that you're speaking to, uh, it probably calls for more work than you might be giving it today. You know, and, and it's funny you said that about even in the chiropractic space, you would never just go willy nilly and let the spirit speak through you. I have actually heard speakers take the stage and admit that they are completely ill-prepared, but what they say is they've done it intentionally. They're just going to let the spirit flow through them and we'll see what comes out. Let me literally, I'm not joking. I've heard this. And what I have said is that I feel like that's disrespectful. I mean, and I like this idea of the stakes. It's disrespectful to the audience who has paid money to be there. Like, you know, I, I couldn't imagine that Hamilton came, you know, for the, for the, for the production that they came out and all of the actors and actresses said, look for tonight, we're going to just wing it. Like, so we'll just see what we get. And I know you were expecting, you know, the actual, you know, the, the, the production that you, you thought you, you paid for, but you're not going to get that tonight. Yeah. Um, the preparation is huge. Uh, and for everybody, as we always say here on the None of Your Business podcast, if you're not yet a member of Black Diamond Club, be sure you check it out, www.blackdiamondclub.com, because I'm going to be moving Michael over in a little bit over into the Black Diamond Club for, for some deeper uh discussion about some of these things. You mentioned a couple that I want to go into, the pacing back and forth. Um, and I, I want to talk about how you guys in the program help people to overcome those things. You, are, my second favorite thing, table read I love, second favorite th thing, blocking. And I noticed you do this even just when you're talking because look, you had the workshops, the breakouts and the keynotes, the workshops, mm -hmm. the breakouts and the keynotes. So it, not even spatially having to move on a stage. The ability to command um, even just your own in a small personal space 
a, an awareness of how you're utilizing even your gestures and to use them repeatedly to make a point. Um, tell us a little bit about when we're actually delivering that performance, how we can utilize the stage as a tool to help us to make points. Sure. So one of the stages of the rehearsal process is a stage that is called blocking and staging. Blocking and staging. And uh, the term uh, staging uh, is really a pretty... Uh, uh, it's pretty basic. It means that you've decided where you're going to go, when you're going to go there, and why you're going to go there. That doesn't mean it's easy to do, but it's a basic concept. Rather uh, than just standing on a stage and uh, and you know pacing around or just standing in one spot, not doing anything, uh, you know you can. I mean, you can pretty quickly burn a hole, you know, in a in the carpet. <laughs> I mean, this is what you usually see when people are giving speeches or it, or sometimes if they're doing like a TED style talk, they'll just kind of sway like this, which is really problematic when it's uh, filmed because, you know, if you do this throughout a speech, your audience is not going to realize why at first, but they're going to get a little bit seasick, <laughs> a little nauseous, <laughs> right? if you're just pacing back and forth like this. So, um, so uh, staging is the intentional um, choices you make with respect to where you go on stage, when you go there, and why you go there. Blocking is the same thing. It's just an industry term in the acting world that uh, developed out of the way that directors used to uh, decide where the actors are going to go. Back, back in the old days, they'd have a, 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 essentially a box and they'd have the set built on the box, and they'd have these little, um, there, I'll just use one of these, these little blocks, and each actor was a little block, and they would move them around. So they called it blocking. That's, that's where the term came from. But <clears throat> it's really important to understand blocking and staging because if you decide to be intentional about your movement when you're performing, you're going to be better equipped at getting your message across to the audience and influencing how they feel. Because if your body is not aligned with what you're saying, then it gets confusing to an audience. So for example, if I said, if I'm, if I'm back, uh, let's say I'm back here and, um, or let's say, I'll, let's say I'm over here and I say, so we went forward. <laughs> And it's confusing to the audience because I just moved backwards. He said, but they're talking about, he's in the story, he's talking about going forward. Um, or if, you know, if I've got a whole bunch of different concepts that I want to introduce and I introduce them all in the same place, then those concepts start to blend together. But if I can say, all right, so look, um, the first thing you want to do is X. Bah, 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 bah. The second thing you want to do is Y. And the third thing you want to do is Z. Well, then um, I'm able to start to break up those ideas so that it's easier for people to organize uh, those ideas in their own mind. And I can always go back to those original spots when, uh, when, touching, when touching back on that particular concept to help reaffirm it. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you always have to be in the same place when you're introducing that particular concept or, or referencing that particular concept. Um, but it, it can really help the audience. Um, you know, when you're telling a story about the time that, you know, you were in a car, well, it might help to pull out uh, a seat and put yourself right in the car. And so when I swerved, right, all of a sudden now it starts to come to life. So you're staging what you're sharing so that rather than just telling people, you're now starting to show them. You're now, you're creating a visual art so that they can see it as well as hear it. Because speakers often think that their job is to share information. And yes, absolutely, information or education is one aspect uh, of a presentation. But if you want to deliver a transformational presentation, you need to find the overlap between the educational content or the educational elements 
and the theatrical elements, where they overlap, that's where you start to get transformational experiences for the audience. Because we've all been to uh, uh, a college lecture that was very informative. You may have had some of these when you were in chiropractic school. You left there thinking, wow, that dude was smart. Um, I, I, I learned a lot, but holy cow, it took a lot of work to stay awake. <laughs> And then you might have had an experience where you went to see some kind of performance art and you left there thinking, wow, that was amazing. I have no idea what it was about, but that was really fun. <laughs> so those are on the two extremes. But if you can find a way to marry the theatrical elements and the educational elements so that it becomes experiential for the audience, well, now you're in a whole nother category and not only do they get the information intellectually, but they're also getting an entertaining experience because of the theatricality, which makes it a lot easier for them to absorb and consume the ideas because they're having a lot more fun and they can pay attention in a more uh, uh, complete manner. And that's going to create a, a much better experience for them. That's excellent. Before I jump over into the Black Diamond Club with you, Two things. One, why why is it so important? Why why are you so passionate about teaching other people how to speak? I mean, you could just say, "I have the ticket. I'm going to go out and you know now I I have the ability to command two hundred thousand dollars for a talk because nobody else knows how to do what I know how to do." Why are you sharing this with people? And once we've covered that, how can people engage with you? Because I honestly think that anybody, I think there's a couple of things. I think that almost every person um, that's in the service world has a book in them because there's a story to tell. But then beyond that, I think that almost every person in the service industry has a duty to be able to speak and communicate their message in this way, not just leave it to chance and wing it. So how can people get in touch with you and get plugged in with, with your programs? Yeah, sure. Well, I love doing this because I think there's this there's this myth out there that um, that public speaking is scarier to people than dying. <laughs> you know, you've all, all, all heard that you've heard that. Well, there's a study that says people are more afraid of public speaking than dying. No, there isn't. It's not true. The study that people are referencing did not demonstrate that at all. And the author of the study he's like, I don't know where why this, you know, became a thing and why people misquote this study. All that meant was that public speaking is a more common fear because you often have to do it on a regular basis. You don't have to die on a regular basis. You only get to do that once. So fortunately, most people are not thinking about their, you know, uh, their uh, upcoming death on a daily basis. But they are often thinking about, oh, my God, I got to give a presentation at 4 o'clock this afternoon. I'm totally freaking out. Why are they freaking out? Because they're not prepared. So people often ask, how do I reduce anxiety? How do I get over the fear? I am nervous all the time. I, I have a, just a general high level of anxiety. But, and I'm nervous even going into a podcast interview because I'm like, I want to do a good job for them. I want it to be a good use of time. You know, that's totally normal. And I think there's no reason to have to overcome that kind of anxiety. It's perfectly normal because you're excited about it. So the, the thing that I really want to help people with is this debilitating fear that people have of it. And in large part, it's a debilitating fear because they're not prepared to do it. If I have to give a speech where I'm not prepared, I am utterly, utterly terrified even though I have enough technique to be able to go out there and probably wing it better than the average speaker. But I'm still petrified because I know it will be subpar. But if I've prepared in such a way that I know exactly what I'm going to do before I do it, then my anxiety goes down. I'm excited. I'm nervous because you never know something could go wrong and then I'll just have to deal with that and figure this out. And blah, blah. That's normal. That's excitement. Just like, you know, uh, I'm sure even Tom Brady gets nervous before a Super Bowl after having done it as many times as he has. I'm sure he still gets butterflies and anxious. But I'll tell you what, that guy is prepared. He knows exactly what his plans are and how he wants to win that Super Bowl. And just like the greatest performers, 
We know exactly what we're going to do before we do it. So the anxiety levels are very, very low as a result. And that's how you go out and deliver a great performance. Not by thinking you're going to rise to the occasion. And then if people want to, uh, to come and learn more, uh, they can go to heroicpublicspeaking.com, heroicpublicspeaking.com. Uh, right now, there's a, a really great uh, free primer on how to give virtual presentations. Because, of course, right now, most people are delivering presentations virtually. Fortunately, uh, October on the professional circuit right now is looking, it, it, most speakers who are, are working speakers are getting booked up for you know almost every day of the week uh, for October at this point, mostly for hybrid type events where some in person, some at home, but the momentum is coming back and it's really wonderful to see. Uh, but go to heroicpublicspeaking.com and we do, um, uh, every once in a while, we do free multi-day virtual events. Uh, so if you're signed up at heroicpublicspeaking.com, you'll get invitations to those free events. And then once the pandemic is over, we'll be able to bring people back into our headquarters here where we have a theater and rehearsal rooms, about 10,000 square feet. And we do uh, two-day events that we call HPS core events. Now, these are by referral only. They're free. We don't charge anything for those two-day events, but they are by referral only. And so if you are a, uh, a listener of, of Sean's uh, podcast or uh, in the Black Diamond Club, if you're in the Black Diamond Club, definitely tell us because uh, we can get you to the front of the list for because we always have a waiting list for those events because they are for free and they are referral only. But make sure you let us know that Sean sent you uh, so we can make sure to get you in and hold the spot for you. Home run. I 110% recommend that anybody who has a message, if you have a message to share with the world, you must get plugged in. Go to heroicpublicspeaking.com. Um, sign up, start consuming that free material. Um, watch for these opportunities to engage with Michael and his beautiful wife, Amy. They are the best in the business. And when you look, go to the website, look at the look at the testimonials, not like four or five by Brenda J from Tulsa, Oklahoma, like legit people that you've heard speaking on the circuit. Michael, let's um, bounce over into the Black Diamond Club. I have just a few more questions for you to help our members there. For everybody tuning into the None of Your Business podcast, thank you so much for listening. Make sure that you subscribe and leave a review. Let Michael know one of the one of the tips that I've also heard is that um, even when you're a guest on a podcast, you circle back and look at those reviews. You want to see if people said nice things. So leave a nice comment for Michael Port on the None of Your Business uh, reviews as well. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back again next week with a brand new episode of the None of Your Business podcast.